Hello and welcome to our Wider View podcast, where we take a closer look at the big topics in the packaging industry with um, thought leaders and major industry players. So my name is Elisabeth Skoda, and today I'll be speaking with Malte Schlüter, who is Global Director for Food and Beverage and Life Sciences at Mitsubishi Electric Europe. And uh, we'll discuss digitalization, digital transformation and smart factories and um, the effect they're having on the packaging industry and some recent developments in the area as well. So, um, yeah, Malte, uh, welcome uh, to the podcast and thank you very much for, for being here today. Hello, Elizabeth. Nice to meet you. And it's great to be here and uh, to be able to talk about uh, my favorite subject, the <laughs> packaging industry and food and beverage and life science. So, yeah, I was wondering um, to start off with, obviously, phrases like digitalization, smart factory and digital transformation often talked about in the packaging industry, but they mean different things to different people. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts about how far the global packaging industry has come in its digitalization efforts so far, and also which technologies have been most widely implemented and in which areas has uptake been a bit slower. Well, let's be let's be realistic. I think we are really at the beginning, uh, especially in the packaging industry. Uh, we are really at the early beginning of digitalization. Uh, other industries like automotive industries are much further and they are really deep into the digitalization. But the packaging industry so far is also very labor oriented still. Mm -hmm. So even premium products, they are hand packed and there's a lot of uh, manual labor work uh, to be seen. But uh, we can see also, of course, with the pandemic, uh, the corona um, situation, uh, we see that uh, especially the global end users have started to change their strategies to implement digitalization and uh, yeah to, to invest heavily into that field. And that not only in the production field, of course, but also in the packaging areas. Of course, the drivers are the Western countries like France, Germany, Italy, but we see also other countries, global countries, they are coming up very fast in the digitalization in this area. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's really a race. Uh, and I think a lot of companies have understood if they don't invest into digitalization, they might have huge issues on the global markets in the future. So things are moving on here and, and we can see that, uh, yeah, the, the efforts are really taken. I was wondering, um, you mentioned that uh, the packaging industry is still a little bit behind, but um, could you give me some examples of how the concept of the smart factory is already impacting the packaging industry? Well, the smart factories are impacting insofar as smart packaging is that, uh, yeah, as I said, the big end users are investing and they are looking also into solutions. Solutions, uh, yeah, replace labor work uh, by robotics, by automation, uh, also collecting data there. Uh, we are talking about uh, predictive maintenance, preventive maintenance. We are talking about quality, digital quality insurance. These are all the fields where I can tell you we also from Mitsubishi, we are able really to play a role and uh, to help um, the machine builders, but also the end users to upgrade the, the brownfields. So the existing lines where people are working to pack in things, some of things are of course done automatically, a lot of things are still manual. We get in there, we are getting there with our concepts to introduce digitalization. And um, I was wondering for the benefit of our listeners who may be still a bit unfamiliar with the concepts, um, could you explain how AI and deep learning can be applied to improve overall product quality and efficiency along the packaging supply chain? Of, of course. Um, you know, uh, typically what you find is, is we, are, we are talking about packaging lines. And these lines are consisting today at, at most factories of standalone machines. And in these machines, you have a lot of information. There's a lot of 
digital data that can be harvested and that can be used to see how well and how efficient these lines are running. So that's the efficiency of the line, uh, improving speeds. But at the second time, what you can do with adding simple technologies like vision sensors, you can check that the packaging quality is consistent. Today, we have very often, if you, if you take, off, for example, the primary packaging of uh, coffee capsules, um, today they are destroyed. So what they are doing is they're taken randomly out of a, a production line. So they are primarily coffee is packed into capsules. They are taking randomly capsules out and they're destroying them. And today, this optimized vision system based on AI and deep learning, we are able to see that, uh, for example, the ceiling, the final ceiling of a coffee capsule is not going well, or we have some coffee powder underneath or some air bubbles underneath or too hot or the cold ceiling that can be seen in such an early stage that we don't have to reject the capsules. Today, it's done in a way that they take some samples, they test the samples, and if they find there are issues, they have to throw away a complete batch of coffee capsules. So this is a huge of waste. And with these new AI technologies, you're able to, to predict the quality to prevent um, failures happening. So you are doing a close look uh, pr uh, prescriptive maintenance. And with this close look uh, predictive maintenance, you are able to correct things before they happen. So then in, in the best case is, for example, the deep learning vision system is recognizing that the color of the ceiling on the capsule is too dark. So we have too much temperature. So the easy thing is now is to cool down uh, the capsule that cool down the ceiling head, but that takes long. So this is a very slow process. So what you typically do is you make your production a little bit faster so that you have less time of the heating head on the ceiling, and then you have corrected. And of course, you are not doing that when it's too hot and burned, but you do it when you see a slight change in it. And by that, you can guarantee that you have a constant output of quality and you are predicting the quality and you're measuring the quality. And by that, you really have no waste in your production and you have uh, yeah, smooth production and even higher outputs. This is very, very important. So this is one of these cases. The other case, of course, is predicting the quality of the automation. So we have a lot of gearboxes, we have a lot of mechanics in these packaging processes. And what we can do is we can measure the resonance, the, the vibration of this gearbox, we can measure the um, vibration of motors. And by that we can predict, is there an issue, is there oil missing in the gearbox, for example, is there uh, something with the inner or outer ring of a motor? Is there a problem? You know, it's not failing immediately, but if you don't do something, if you are not aware of this situation, it can happen that after a short while, these motors will die and then your production is stopped and, and uh, unplanned stoppages is the worst thing you can have in your production. So, and, and with this prediction, Again, they are AI analyzing the data collected on the line of the motor of the servo amplifiers, amplifiers. Those are predicting when something will happen and they will inform you what will happen. And so maintenance people can be planned easily to repair before a problem happens. Yeah, and these are planned stoppages. These you have anyhow, you have to do your maintenance and you can combine this in the standard maintenance routine. Yeah, it sounds like there's some um, quite varied but some um, quite tangible benefits there. Looking to the, the future, um, obviously it's always hard to predict the future, but um, how do you see these technologies um, developing going forward? Um, what might be possible in the future? I, I think in the future what we will see is that um, we, and of course our system integrators, our partners, we will develop lines that are built to a specification installed to a specification and started a specification. But with these measures of self-adjusting, self-improving, so the productivity is measured with edge computers, you know, all there's a lot of industrial digital data to be harvested. And this can be analyzed with analytic tools and AI formulas. And then the machines will over time get even more productive, more productive. And uh, yeah, it's not that you install a machine like today, and then you try to maintain it for over years to 
keep up to the same productivity. But what you do is you install to a specification and then over time, the machine is getting better and better. Learning by itself, listening to itself and informing, of course, the operators and the owner of the machines, what can be done to improve the processes and improve the complete functionality. So that, that is the future in the lines. So from what you've said um, so far, I think it's probably fair to say that the truly transformative potential of dig digital technologies had not, has not yet fully been realized in the packaging industry. And um, I was wondering what your thoughts are, what might such digital transformation look like? For example, the move from sequential production and packaging lines to a different paradigm. Yes, correct. I mean, what I just described is how can I improve existing lines? How can I improve brownfields? And that can be done a lot with the data and uh, yeah, implementing uh, technologies. I think the future will be look, looking differently. Uh, we, we are noticing more and more that we have the personalization. So people want to have their things, their SKUs packed at a certain standard, at a certain quantity, at a certain mix. So we have a high variation of same things differently packed for different uh, point of sales, for, for different end users. We, we have to talk about um, all the online sales, uh, online distribution channels. So you need the same product in a lot of different formats. And of course, uh, yes, we have some mass market, but you have also smaller quantities. You have personalization. People want to print digitally their logo onto a sleeve of coffee capsules, for example. So this is a personalization you can produce. And uh, to, to win this, we see also that uh, the digitization is so we talked about data and we talked about software optimization now the next thing of course you have to have actuators so the classical thing where you build machines that in serial produce tons of the same product are over what you need is to switch over formats switch over um yeah kind of products you're packing on these lines we have a lot also a lot of co-packers they don't know tomorrow what they have to pack so they need machines that are extremely highly flexible and that can be achieved with robotics the the great thing on a robotics compared to a classical machine design is that a robotics arm can with some software changes used for total different usage yeah, we're talking about collaborative robots, collaborative robots that can be on trolleys. You just move to a place where normally a human is working and then the robot takes over his work or he supports the human. Yeah? That's a real collaboration. And um, so this is also one of the next steps in the uh, digital factory. So you will see that you use a lot of robots. These robots are highly flexible. And then you have a lot of different outputs of like I said before, same product, totally differently packed for different channels of distribution. Thank you. And um, obviously, you mentioned um, collaborative with robots, cobots. Um, and I understand that Mitsubishi's sister cobot is set to play a role in ensuring safety and improved productivity in the factories of the future. Um, would you be able to highlight the benefits of this solution and why would you say does it represent a step forward in the industry? Well, the Mepha sister cobot is a hybrid cobot. So it's, uh, on one side, it's a 100% collaborative robot. Yeah? It's a robot that can work next to a human. The human touch the robot, the robot will stop. And uh, as soon as you press a button, or you can even have, it depends on, on, on the company who is using it. They have different safety concepts. It, it's always safe, but some allow to restart the robot immediately when it was touched. Yeah, and it's let loose, or others say, hey, you have to press the start button. This is all possible, but uh, a collaborative robot is working next to a human together with a human. But the problem, of course, in this case, it's slow like a human. So these classical uh, collaborative robots are slow as humans, typically 250 millimeter per second, top speed, that is collaborative speed. But um, a lot of, lot of companies, they are not searching just as a cooperator to the human, but they want to replace the human. But from time to time, they want to be able to go in with the operators, with the workers, and to assist the robot or to inspect the robot. And then, of course, it has to be safe. So this Melfi sister robot, collaborative robot, is a hybrid. So he can work 
as a 100% cobot, safe surface, you can't clamp your fingers, everything is safe. But at the same time, you can let it run as an industrial robot at high speed, 1000 millimeter per second, for example. And what we do is we combine these robots with laser scanners. So we are scanning the area around the robot. And when we see there's a human coming, we are switching from the industry speed over to collaborative speed. Uh, in, in this way, the robot will continue its work, of course, slow like a human. But as, as soon as the operator is gone again, he's back to industrial speed and the productivity is there where you need it. So this, this combination is done on the Melfa Assisted Collaborative Robots of Mitsubishi Electric. Yes, it's interesting that you say slow as a human, but obviously yeah, that makes sense because... Um... Machines can be can be a lot quicker, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, you've um, previously already alluded that there is a reluctance among some segments of the packaging value chain to fully embrace all the opportunities for digitalization. And um, I was wondering, why do you think that is? Um, are there any risks or perceived risks for the packaging industry, and um, how could this could these um, worries or perceived risks be addressed? Well, it's it's. Let, let me say it in, in, in another way. I think it's not the end users. End users have understood we have to do, we have to invest into digitalization, we have to invest into automation, we have to invest into robotics because it's a benefit overall. Of course, uh, a lot is co-packing. So this is uh, re really at, at a lower segment of prices. So there are, people are discussing about cents, of course. So it's really a price-driven market. And in this price-driven market, of course, you especially, I'm not talking about Germany, Switzerland has the most expensive labor costs, but we are talking about um, Poland, uh, Eastern countries. There, the cost of labor is, of, of course, much lower. And then, of course, you have to do a very good calculation, the total cost of ownership uh, calculation for the people. Does it make sense to automate or can I do it for the same price with human employees? But like I said before, with the pandemic, we are facing things are changing. Things are moving over to, um, to um, yeah, people need to be safe. If People suddenly are ill on a one shift, a shift is stopped, you lose production. So these are all trends that are influencing that even those companies that have been very carefully with investing into technology, yeah, they are starting to invest. The other thing, of course, is the level of technology. Uh, those companies are not used to robots. They are not used to automation. They are afraid that they are faced with technical problems. So what we are doing here, we are offering complete solutions with close-up service interventions. You can even close the service contract with us and we take over, we maintain the, the line at at your needs. And what we can do is, of course, we can use the data from the digitalization, we can use this data and we get an information when we have to do intervention, when do we have to grease, uh, grease a gearbox, for example. So we can do everything predictive so that the productivity is very high. And very important is that these companies, these co-packing companies have no work with the automation. It's a service we are offering. And uh, at, at the end of the day, they are highly productive and uh, producing a lot, uh, have the flexibility with the robotics, as I, I mentioned before. So all this is, is on the move. But of course, it's some work to convince the people to show this uh, with good use cases. And uh, yeah, we, we are very successful in doing this. Yes, I'd imagine that peace of mind is um, is very reassuring for companies to have and maybe makes them a bit more likely to um, to invest. Um, I was wondering, are there any other emerging digital technologies of which the wider world might not be yet aware that may come to shape the future of the packaging industry? Yeah, well, well, of course, uh, we, are, we are talking a lot about uh, polymers, uh, ban of polymers, we are talking about using different kind of uh, substrates for the packaging industry. We try to say we want to minimize the size of the packaging. So what we will see in the future, we will see more and more local packaging, like not mass packaging anymore, but we need, we will see local packaging and packaging with new substrates, with 
um, this growing um, um, substrates that are that are not polymer based but that are plant based we will see a lot of these things but what we see immediately is that these substrates are much more difficult to handle in the machines so what you need is you need a much more precise control algorithm on the machine so in in fact today a packaging machine is technically seen for an automation guy like us very simple technology very simple technology but in the future we will see it's getting more and more complex and we will have a lot of variation in the quality of the packaging machines um, packaging material and what we will see is also their ai will come in and will measure while it's running the quality of the of the sleeves of the of the film that is used, the thickness of the film will be measured, and then automatically the parameters and the processes of the machine will adjust to these changing demands. And uh, yeah, that's again, it's a closed loop regulation of the packaging process, yeah, saving resources, saving costs, and making sure that the productivity is at, is at the highest level. So these, these are things that are coming in the future. And by all this, we are also, of course, we are collecting a lot of information, uh, uh, can use that in clouds and also to, to help to design packagings of the future. So it's really a complete closed um, co collaboration uh, in that industry where, you know, it's uh, along the value chain and you have not only the product and the thing that uh, the product that needs to be packed and the packaging, but you have the packaging material that needs to produce, you have the logistics. So there are a lot of parameters. You have the substrates. So it's a lot of things that are coming together and they have to work together. And, and the data from the production of the packaging material, the, the data of the production of the good, that all can taken together to optimize automatically the packaging process. And, and that is something we will see in the future. And I, I, I tell you, uh, in, in five years from now, you will not sell any packaging machine anymore that has not a full digital interface into the line and into the full communication of the factory. It'll be interesting to see how this all pans out and how, um, how the digitalization progresses in, in the packaging industry. Yeah, finally, to wrap up, I was wondering, are there any recent collaborations you'd like to draw your attention to, which highlight the um, transformative role Mitsubishi Electric Solutions and uh, also digital technology as a whole can play in the industry? I think that's, that's something that is very important. Everybody who thinks digitalization can be done by one company and one company only is, is totally wrong. Yeah? Digitalization is based on platforms platforms where different um, experts are coming together. So we, Mitsubishi Electric, we are experts in automation. We are experts in robotics. We are experts in control algorithms, software, um, you know, all, all, all the complete platform that has to do with automation. But of course, as I said before, we are talking about deep learning. Deep learning is a the, the, the king of um, the king of uh, AI, and we would uh, would never dare to start our own activities to program deep learning software. So we have partners out there, e-factory partners that are working with us. Same for vision cameras. I mean, we would never get uh, the idea to develop our own vision sensors for the packaging industry, but uh, we are using the a collaboration and we are creating the interfaces. So it's really a platform economy we are creating here where experts of different fields ai vision um, there might be even uh, some so you need a lot of glue in the packaging industry so the glue pumps and the glue material all this comes together the experts comes together and in total you create the smart factory of the future great yeah that would be um, very interesting to keep an eye on and um, see um, how everything develops so yes, thank you very much, Malte. That brings us to the end of today's podcast. Uh, that just leaves me to um, say thank you for a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. And it was really nice to talk to you. And uh, I hope I was able to explain some of these really sometimes very difficult topics in a way that everybody can understand. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>